This recipe for pork roulade with fennel and roast lemon is sponsored by Squarespace. Everything you need to make and run a website all wrapped up into one big jelly roll. Get 10% off your site with my link and code in the description. Here's a really nice roast to do for company, an all-in-one meal that feeds like eight people and looks way more expensive and harder to make than it actually is. The stuffing starts with a bulb of fennel, cut off the stalks, which themselves are virtually inedible, but keep them around so that we can pick off the fronds at the end. The bulb itself, we actually need to get chopped up pretty fine, so I'm going to cut it down the middle and then basically chop it up like an onion. On its side, thin slices down to the root, then mow through the slices. Toss the root. If there's any big pieces that don't get broken up, chop through those. Get yourself a wide pan. Chrissy Teigen pan, activate! A little olive oil, then throw in the fennel and get it cooking on medium-high heat. We'll also cut up an onion. I like red for the color, but it could be anything. Slice in half, peel, thin slices to the root, mow through the slices. In those go with the fennel. Grab a wooden spoon, stir, and give those a good five-minute head start before adding in one pound or half a kilo of Italian sausage, sweet or hot. I couldn't get bulk sausage, so I have to cut mine out of its casings. Start breaking that up and mixing it in with the wooden spoon, and here's the only labor-intensive part. This really tastes a lot better if you cook the crap out of it. Evaporate a ton of water out of it so that you can really fry it brown in its own fat. You gotta stir almost constantly, medium-high heat. At first, there should be enough water in the pan to deglaze any fond that starts to form on the bottom of the pan. But now, here we are a full 20 minutes after I put in the sausage, and there's not enough water left to dislodge that fond that's about to burn. So in goes a splash of cheap white wine, just the perfect universal deglazing liquid. Just enough to deglaze the pan, no more. I want a dry texture at the end, not a saucy texture. When the pan is clean, I'll turn off the heat, just keep stirring and scraping as it cools just to make sure that nothing sticks and burns. If you don't want to use wine, use water or stock and hit it with a splash of vinegar here at the end. Now for breadcrumbs, just enough to soak up any loose liquid in there. I put in maybe half a cup of this panko, that's what I had handy, but any reasonably dry breadcrumbs would work just fine. There's easily enough salt and other flavorings in there already, thanks to the sausage meat, but the zest of one lemon will really freshen up the flavor and it goes great with pork. Mix that in, and that just needs to sit and cool down while we get the oven preheating. I'm doing 375 Fahrenheit or 190C convection. If your oven doesn't have a convection fan, I'd go a little bit hotter. This is one half of a pork loin. It's about three and a half pounds or one and a half kilos. Please note that pork loin is not the same thing as pork tenderloin. The loin is a much bigger muscle. But if possible, buy a piece of loin that is particularly long and thin, like this one is. And I would absolutely not trim that fat cap off of it. That's going to melt and go crisp. I'm annoyed at how much the processor trimmed it. Now we need to butterfly this, that is, cut it into a uniform, wide, thin sheet of meat. And I will do that by cutting along a little zip zigzag. First cut goes down from here down to one side, but not all the way through. Whoops, I bumped into you there. Lay that flap out and you'll see that I've got basically one third of the total thickness hanging off to the side. Now I want to cut along this line to get the rest to half of its current thickness. Cut to the end, but not through. Lay out that flap. And if you have any areas that are not lying flat or they just seem too thick, you can just slice down into them a little bit and then pull that area apart. There we go. Now for hygiene purposes, I'm going to lay down a couple sheets of plastic wrap just to keep any meat bits from flying away while I smash this thing with a smooth meat pounder. Don't go psycho on the thing. We don't want to make any holes. Just get the meat as wide and flat as you can. Now look at the underside and note which side has the fat cap. We want the fat cap on the outside of the roast, not rolled up inside it, so we're going to start spooning out our stuffing onto the side that does not have the fat. It should feel like you don't have quite enough stuffing. You want it to be very thin, very uniform layer, and it should stop a couple of inches before you get to the end that has the fat on the other side. That little flap is going to be our seal. Start at the other end and just roll her up. There's no trick to it, just trying to make sure that that fat cap is going to be on top and there we go. Kind of looks like a blobfish from this angle. If it had been a thicker piece of loin to begin with, it would be really untenably thick now. It would just take too long to cook and it'd dry out. Now it's time to tie it. This is butcher's twine. Do yourself a favor and cut a bunch of pieces before you actually start tying. Each of these pieces is long enough to wrap around the roast and give me plenty of slack to tie a knot. You want one per every couple inches or five centimeters of meat. You take one and just kind of nudge it under the roast and I'm going to do a butcher's knot, which is like a normal overhand knot, except you loop back around one or two additional times before pulling it taut and then locking it off with a standard overhand knot. I'll show you 
that again from a better angle. You just nudge under another piece and tie off a couple of inches down from the first one and repeat. Here's that butcher's knot again. Cross two ends over each other and then loop one under. That's an overhand knot. Now if you pull it taut and let it go, you'll see that it doesn't hold. It doesn't have enough friction. But if you do the overhand knot and then loop the string under an extra time or two, when you pull that taut, it'll hold nice and strong, long enough for you to lock it off with a simple overhand knot. That is the virtue of the butcher's knot, but it's not a huge deal. Just tie the thing tight however you can. When it's all tied up, I think it's worth it to go back and trim off most of your excess twine. Those little bits can burn and get stuck in the meat. Just get rid of them. Yo, dog, I heard you like sausage, so I made you a sausage stuffed with sausage. We'll need something to roast it in, and I see no reason to use anything other than the pan we've already gotten dirty. Though, if you use this, you've got to wipe out any bits of chunkies still clinging to the walls. Those would burn in the oven and cause problems with our pan sauce later. I'm leaving the fond, just dumping out the crumbs. I don't care that this is too big for the pan. I'll just coil it around the edge. Again, fat side up. That's the part that's going to go crisp. Drizzle olive oil on top and then grind on a ton of pepper. That might seem like too much, but it's not just for the top. I'm going to smoosh it all over the whole exterior of the meat. Same deal with the salt. Enough salt on top to cover it everywhere, two or three big pinches. Then get your hands in there and smoosh. Get everything coated in oil and seasonings. Last thing to do is to cut that lemon that we zested in half and lay it cut side down in the pan. You could do as many as will fit in there. This will help keep the exposed pan surface from burning in the oven, and roasted lemons are lovely. In the oven that goes right in the middle, and that'll take about an hour. Halfway through, it looks like this. You can see that fat on top just starting to melt and go crisp. If you baste this roast, it'll come out with a darker, more succulent crust. If you don't baste it, it'll come out with a drier, crispier crust, and I honestly can't decide which way I like better. So this time I'm splitting the difference, and I'm just going to baste it this one time halfway through. Check this out. This is my new favorite thing. I'm going to position my probe thermometer now when the meat is half cooked instead of at the beginning when the meat was raw. Why? Because I can move the probe in and out slightly lightly until I find the lowest temperature. Whichever spot is least hot at this moment is going to be the dead center of the meat. If I position the probe at the beginning, I just have to guess where dead center is. Back this goes into the oven. I want to roast it until the internal temperature is 140 Fahrenheit or 60 degrees C. We're approaching there now, and the outside of the roast is not as dark as I would like, so I'm going to jack up the temperature for this last leg. All right, almost to 140, and it's rising fast, so I got to get ready to take this out, and out it comes. Look at that. That crisp crispy fat layer on top is what you get by not basting. This roast is not cooked yet, but a big thing like this is going to have a ton of carryover heat. It might go up a whole other 10 or 15 degrees Fahrenheit as it rests on the cutting board. Look, it's already up to 144. Now with the lemons out too, I'm going to bring this pan back to a boil on high heat, and when it's there, I'm going to pour in like half a bottle of that cheap white wine and deglaze with the wooden spoon. Once the bottom of the pan is clean, I'm going to boil that and reduce it down until it's just starting to get syrupy. If you don't want to use wine, again, I would use water or stock with a big glug of vinegar. White balsamic vinegar gets you both the sour and the sweet of white wine. Check it out. That roast is 153 now. That is carryover. Heat from the outside of the meat continuing to move into the center, and you got to respect it. If you don't account for carryover, you're going to totally overcook your roast, which really should rest for at least 20 minutes, so no rush on this sauce. As soon as it's looking a little syrupy, I'll turn the heat off and just let that coast the rest of the way. When the bubbling stops, I might mix in a little bit of butter just to help emulsify the pork fat into the water phase, but I'm not really looking to make a thick sauce here. What I really want is a jus, a nice, thick thin juice to glaze over the pork, so it's fine that it's on the acidic side. You're not going to have very much of it in each bite. Before you carve, cut off the string and get rid of it, and I'm going to do an inch or a couple of centimeters thick. You can go thinner, but if you go too thin, the stuffing won't hold together. The first piece, the end piece, that's the ugliest and yet most delicious, which means it's my piece. Here we get to the pretty pieces, and if we've done our job, the pork loin meat should still be a little pink in the center. I think that's how pork loin is best, and for mainstream pork here in the U.S., Canada, West Western Europe, this is totally safe. In countries where pork tapeworm is a thing, you have to get a little hotter to be safe. One slice or two slices on the plate. I don't make a side dish with this. There's plenty of veg and a little starch in the stuffing. A couple spoonfuls of that beautiful jus over top, and then we'll get those fennel fronds we saved. You could pick them off onto a cutting board and chop them up a little bit before you put them on. That would get you more of a stand.
standard herb garnish vibe, I like to pull them off in big chunks and put a little forest of them on. It's almost like a salad on top, which again renders a side dish unnecessary. Cut into this and that crispy outer fat is just insane. The stuffing inside is surprisingly sweet. Fennel goes really sweet when you cook it a long time, and obviously so does onion. And hey, remember those roasted lemons? Might seem like a lot of juice, but roasting lemons really knocks back the acidity. This is a very satisfying meal all rolled up into one, just as Squarespace has everything you need for a website all rolled into one. It has beautiful, functional templates for almost any purpose. Maybe you're trying to rent out a property or get potential employers to notice you, or maybe you just need a launch page to let everyone know that something big is coming. Rolled into the template is everything you would need to slot in your own pictures and words, everything you'd need to register a custom domain, everything you'd need to take money or emails or reservations from people, everything you need to put out a newsletter, everything you need to understand who is looking at your site. It's all here in one big juicy roll, and you can start using Squarespace for free. But when it's time to actually publish your site or register your domain, you can save 10% by going to squarespace.com slash Ragusea and using my code Ragusea. You'll be helping us both out. And help yourself to this delicious and kind of fancy roast, as Lauren put it. Mm, that tastes like a holiday. <laughs> 